Well, air pollution is the world's largest environmental health risk, killing an estimated 7 million people every year. Clean air makes all the difference in the world in terms of making you feel better, more comfortable. Your brain will work better, you can think more clearly, uh, and uh, you can actually perform better. Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Clean Air, where we find out more about how clean air can affect the quality process for you and the workplace. In this, our first podcast, we get an overview of why we should be thinking about air quality, along with the pros and cons to consider. My name is Dusty Rhodes and joining me today is environmental campaigner and advisor Simon Burkett, along with Peter Diamond from Campfill. A little about Simon Burkett. He moved from a career in finance to found Clean Air, a campaign to help the City of London comply with WHO guidelines for air quality. He's a regular contributor internationally on the issue of air pollution. And Peter Diamond is a technical manager at Campfill, a global organisation who provide commercial and industrial systems for air filtration and air pollution control, which improves worker and equipment productivity and minimises energy use. Simon, if I can start with you, what are the main concerns around air quality that people should be thinking about? Well, air pollution is the world's largest environmental health risk, killing an estimated 7 million people every year. And the way I like to think about it is that um, air pollutants comprise local air pollution or pollution and greenhouse gases, and then obviously the good stuff that we breathe. Those greenhouse gases are what cause climate change, and the local air pollutants comprise really two main categories. I think of them as particles and gases. And the particles are are regulated in a lump for health and legal purposes. So you hear about PM1, PM2.5, PM10, which are particles up to those diameters, but which can come from any source whatsoever, construction, tire and brake wear, anything. Whereas the cloud of gases in air pollution really um, uh, are individual gases, of course, such as nitrogen dioxide, which is a toxic gas. And so you hear about these individual gases, but when you find those in streets and things, uh, it's typically representative of a cloud of those gases. Now, when you say that 7 million people a year die from, uh, you know, bad quality air, are you talking in a specific location or, or a general type of location around the world, or is this evenly spread around the globe? That's a very good question. So uh, in 1952, during the Great Smog, people were worried about the uh, respiratory effects from short-term exposure to very visible air pollution from coal or wood burning. And it was very easy to assess the health effects because pollution in a city would go up and then two or three days later, you could count the coffins. But it wasn't really until about 1995 that a very large study in the United States looked at pollution levels and death rates in six cities, a famous six cities study. And what they found was that long-term exposure to fine particles, PM2.5, was actually a much bigger cause of uh, death on average than what happens during some of these air pollution episodes, which had been reduced by things such as the Clean Air Act. So what we know now is that uh, long-term exposure is a big health risk, combined, of course, with these short-term episodes. uh, And that, of course, can um, hit you or me anywhere in a city or town. So near busy roads, um, near factories, places like that, but also in near other sources outside towns, you know, such as airports or, or big uh, agricultural installations. Mm. Now, as we know, legislation and law and regulations take a, a long time. And you mentioned 1995 there, where they're kind of going, this is a serious problem and it's killing millions of people. Is the law catching up? Are there any regulations being pushed through now about air quality? Uh, fortunately, yes. So in 2005, it wasn't, they weren't published until 2006, but the World Health Organization published 
air quality guidelines for many of the pollutants that we worry about. And those air quality guidelines really um, give a sense of uh, the levels where you're probably safe. The World Health Organization is very clear, however, that their guidelines, they're not recommendations or limits, because in many cases, there is no safe level of exposure to air pollution. Now, a few years later, those WHO guidelines, World Health Organization guidelines, were put in new air quality laws, which were broadened and tightened up, uh, and that they were published in 2008 in Europe. And those binding legal limits have been a big, um, a big force for good in terms of cleaning up our air in cities. And we've seen some quite significant changes, uh, particularly, for example, during the pandemic. But what is surprising is that while um, our diesel pollution um, uh, was much lower last year during the various lockdowns, uh, which is not surprising because um, uh, vehicles haven't been on, on the roads, but what is surprising to me is how much it has fallen, which shows the extent of the problem of diesel, but also we found that particle levels, these um, PM2.5s, PM1s, PM10s, did not reduce even during those lockdowns. And actually, ozone was worse in many cases inside cities and outside. Is there anything that can be done about that? Uh, there is. Um, what we need to do, most important, is to think of the air as one thing, not as air quality or greenhouse gases or other mm -hmm. things. And by thinking of it as one thing, the, the solution just sort of stares you in the face. We need to get to zero air emissions. We need to hammer down all sources of, of air pollution uh, inside buildings and out. Because if we do that, we protect public health. And, of course, we protect ourselves and fight against climate change. So we are at risk of air pollution pretty much evenly across the globe. So it is a planetary thing. Of the people who live on this planet, as in us human beings, what kind of people are most at risk? So around the world, uh, there are some countries which are exposed, uh, where people are exposed to more of one pollutant than another. So, for example, in India or Eastern Europe, people can be exposed to agricultural you know, um, you know, burning of stubble and things or coal-fired um, power stations. Um, in cities uh, in Western Europe, we're worried about um, different sources such as diesel fumes and gas heating and cooking and wood burning. Um, different people are affected by this. So if you think of, uh, I guess, a category of vulnerable people, uh, children um, whose um, lungs, for example, are growing and their bodies are developing, if, if their lung size is uh, doesn't fully develop or it's reduced, of course, they never get that lung size back. So that will affect those children's uh, health for their entire life. Uh, older people, frail people with weaker lungs or hearts, of course, are at risk. Uh, many people who are sick, say, for example, in hospitals. But I think there is a large other category uh, of people who are vulnerable because of underlying health conditions. And we see that there are millions of those, of course, which is what we're being told during this uh, vaccination program for, for um, uh, people most at risk. So when you talk about underlying health conditions, I think this is possibly the one that I would think of in my head when I'm thinking about a factory or a facility or an office building. And if the air isn't properly regulated in those areas, are people with underlying conditions possibly more likely to be um, affected? Well, th there's no question. I mean, m most of us, well, on average, we spend about, well, over 90% of our time indoors uh, in Western Europe and, and the, the developed world. Uh, and, of course, what we have uh, indoors is, of course, the fine particles and gases from outside, but we also have a whole uh, range of uh, sources of air pollution from inside, such as you know, dust, um, uh, candles, fireplaces and stoves, aerosols and pathogens such as viruses, volatile organic compounds um, from cleaning products, formaldehydes from furnishings, and of course nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide from gas heating and cooking. So you've got this real cocktail of pollutants indoors plus what comes from outdoors. 
You know, and and if you're uh, vulnerable outside, you'll of course be vulnerable inside. So uh, it really is important that we think about getting rid of all of these harmful air pollutants, you know, preferably at their source. Let me bring uh, Peter in on that. Uh, Peter, Simon says there that we spend a huge amount of our time indoors and you would automatically assume that you're safer indoors. What do you say to people who assume that they're safer indoors? Well, uh, thank you very much for that one, uh, Dusty. Yes, I very much uh, would like to uh, uh, put forward the case that um, we cannot as- assume that indoor air is uh, safe uh, for us to breathe without risk to health. Um, because we have to uh, bear in mind the threats to, to our health, and they are principally uh, from two sources. Uh, uh, Simon's outlined the outdoor air pollution problem in terms of in cities, traffic, emissions from industrial processes, burning of fossil fuels, incineration of uh, 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 rubbish, this sort of thing can all contribute. Uh, and so um, we have to ventilate our buildings because uh, ventilation is a key uh, requirement for people living and working in buildings. Uh, And uh, we need to, if nothing else, dilute the air from uh, and relieve the uh, level of carbon dioxide uh, because we need to replace that and uh, uh, disperse it uh, as much as possible, particularly in crowded indoor circumstances. So the two main risks to health are outdoor air pollution coming in from diesel traffic emissions or uh, even boilers and burning of fossil fuels. There's a lot of outdoor uh, sources, but indoors it's the risk of transmission of uh, COVID-19 based on aerosol particles Mm. that are emitted from infected people. Ventilation systems, when they're properly set up uh, uh, with uh, good uh, air cleaning capability can offset and mitigate both of these sources of concern. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, we're, we're under a major threat to our health from COVID-19 air transmission. And we've always been, uh, for the last 10, 15 years, subject to high levels of outdoor air pollution in the form of, uh, as Simon has said, fine combustion particulates is PMs, particulate matter. Uh, uh, one. PM 2.5, PM 10, the figures stand for microns. A micron is a very small particle, a thousandth of a millimetre. You can't actually see them uh, once they're below 10 microns. So this is effectively invisible Mm. to the human eye. But the small particles, the reason they're damaging to health is they can penetrate very easily into the human body. They can be inhaled. And uh, the very small ones, the PM 1s, one micron and below, which uh, uh, form a lot of the virus particles and a lot of the traffic emissions uh, can actually get right down into the lungs into a little air sac at the bottom there known as the alveola. And it, could, it, could it be a case then because indoors is a more concentrated uh, and, and confined area that the air indoors is, is actually more dangerous than the air outdoors? Well, certainly it is if you consider, you know, if you get one or two infected people in a building uh, and you get a build-up of uh, infective particles, very Mm. much it can be very dangerous. Uh, And also, as uh, Simon mentioned, you get indoor sources of uh, pollutants, VOCs as they're known, volatile organic compounds. Uh, You can get uh, uh, um, all sorts of... uh, uh, gaseous emissions, even nitrogen dioxide inside, although it principally comes from a lot of the outdoor traffic emissions, that sort of thing. So you need to be looking at World Health Organization uh, factors that give you uh, the limits for exposure. Very important to consider. Uh, mm. And uh, air is actually categorized by technical standards, European standards, and there are very good world standards for judging uh, if you want to clean the air, air filter performance. And that's where we need to be focusing our, our attention if we want to have air cleaning uh, systems that are fit for purpose. So tell me, what, what are the three main standards then that you use? Okay, well, the first one, which is very important, it's the overarching standard, is EN 16798-3. That trips off the tongue, I know. Um, but uh, that one covers, essentially, it's energy in buildings, but it actually uh, outlines the requirements for air filtration uh, uh, as well in part four of the standard. 
uh, as well as part three. Uh, and what the standard actually does is categorize the air. So it uses the World Health Organization limiting factors, for example, PM 2.5, 10 micrograms per meter cubed, and uses that as a factor to determine how clean or dirty the air is, whether it's fit to breathe. Uh, and uh, it, uh, the standard uh, assigns outdoor air with ODA, indoor air, IDA, indoor air, uh, and supply air that's coming into the building, SUP. So that, that's how it uh, categorizes the air. And in fact, it categorizes air in the building by 16 different uh, uh, classifications. So you know exactly where you stand when you're defining air and describing air in a building. So these are the um, categories that are used by consulting engineers, designers, and specifiers to make sure that they select uh, filters that are fit for purpose. Uh, and the way you work out whether an out, a, a supply air filter is fit for purpose is to uh, work out what the concentrations of, for example, PM 2.5 are indoors and outdoors, and then you get a ratio which determines what filter efficiency you need to choose. Tell me, as, as somebody who's not familiar with these things at all, how do you actually measure these things? Well, um, there are two main principles you can use. There's the laboratory instrument for measuring particles, uh, known as particle counting. Very accurate, extremely expensive, uh, and so therefore it tends to be quite often used in laboratory testing, uh, although there are portable units that are quite good and accurate, but they have to be quite frequently recalibrated in order to maintain their accuracy. Uh, and then you have what is known as air monitors, which are not quite such good accurate technology, but they're certainly these days uh, uh, definitely good enough to tell you if you've got a problem in terms of uh, uh, concentrations of particulates, uh, and you can actually get measurement sensors for gases as well. So the technology is there, and some of the best uh, air monitoring units can be used not just for outputting data, say, to a mobile phone network and, a, uh, a you know, what we call a dashboard, which gives you temperature, humidity, and PM1, PM2.5 concentration as a curve on a screen in real time, storing the data in a mobile phone network. Um, but it can also give you a control function. So you can control a number of air cleaners or air purifiers at the same time and set limits. So you've really got a closed loop of monitoring and control now that's available for people. And we're getting a lot of interest now in offices and schools and, you know, building managers are very keen to uh, um, look into this and come up with effective solutions because, of course, currently schools are no longer being used. So you have to protect people not just in buildings, but specific buildings where you get a lot of people, schools, hospitals, offices. These are the important places. And, of course, uh, people are more than uh, uh, welcome to adopt this technology for their home use because a good monitor like this is probably mm. around about five, six hundred pounds, something like that. So it's although it's expensive, when you consider what you get, uh, it, it's uh, very uh, important and it gives you an idea of how bad the problem might be in terms of air pollution. We talk a lot about the dangers and, 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 and painting gloom and, and, and doom and stuff like that. What are the benefits of good air in a building? Well, health. Um, um, people talk these days a lot about well-being, uh, and uh, it's very much the case that uh, if you have good air quality, and I, we'd be preaching to the converted, uh, if you're an asthmatic or, or somebody who has respiratory problems, uh, clean air makes all the difference in the world in terms of making you feel better, more comfortable, uh, and your, your, your body just functions better. Your brain will work better. You can think more clearly, uh, and uh, you can actually perform better. So that's of interest mm. to employers and people uh, you know, students who want to learn, uh, teachers who are trying to uh, train and teach people, uh, and everybody benefits. It, it, it mm. really is a, um, you know, a virtual. And I just jump in there, Dusty. I mean, I think, you know, one of the things I, um, you know, talk about when I um, um, talk to people in, you know, at events and things like that, because a, a lot of people know that air pollution is a problem. But, but quite often they don't know what to do about it. And I say, well, look, why don't you start? 
by walking down the side streets rather than down the busy roads where all the trucks and the buses and so on are. And, and quite often when you see people again a few weeks later, it's almost as if the scales have dropped from their eyes. You know, when you walk down those side streets, of course, it's quieter and nicer, but actually you can actually feel that the air is cleaner and you feel better. And, and it's, to me, it's this, the opportunity to grasp this sort of cleaner air world, whether it's indoors or outdoors, which really motivates me and why I've spent 15 years campaigning on this issue. Simon, do you think that the air quality regulations need to be readdressed? Uh, that's a jolly good, very timely question, because the World Health Organization is expected to publish this year in 2021 new air quality guidelines. I don't have any inside information about that, although I did attend a meeting with the World Health Organization uh, at the beginning of 2020. Uh, I think that they will substantially tighten uh, the current air quality guidelines, which were uh, um, uh, published in, in 2006. And I think that would just be another reminder with what we're obviously hearing about climate change, mm. why we need to hammer down on all of these harmful emissions at their source. But I see 2021, uh, with all the attention on people's health, but also with uh, the climate change conference in Glasgow at, at the end of the year in November, mm. I see this really as, to me, it is the year of air. It, it's a great opportunity to bring together people's thinking about uh, public health about climate change, think of the air as one atmosphere, and really just tackle these problems at their sources. And of course, one of the real lessons that we've learnt uh, during the you know, terrible time that we've had with, with extraordinary time that we've had with COVID and these lockdowns, is that people have actually found one nice thing, which is, you know, we've all enjoyed breathing cleaner air. Uh, and I don't think people are going to forget that very quickly. So if mm. we can mobilize some of the strong lessons from this COVID-19 pandemic, we can think of things in this one atmosphere sense and really just hammer down on air pollutants. I think we can re-engineer our cities and our homes and our buildings and be much healthier and happier in our cities and towns. Peter, do you think the, the uh, air quality regulations need to be readdressed? I do, and they need to address themselves in relation to the new technical standards. I mentioned EN 16798-3, uh, the World Health Organization uh, limiting factors, of course, but also the air filtration test standards that uh, are current and very much fit for purpose, very close to real-life performance. You've got ISO 16890 for particulate air filters, uh, classifying PM1, PM2.5 and PM10 efficient filters. Very important to use those standards and not some of the older standards uh, for particulate filters, but also molecular gas filters, um, which would be ISO 10121-2 uh, for molecular carbon filters, and that's for removal of nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, uh, NOx and SOx gases, uh, VOCs, uh, aldehydes, all that sort of thing. So you say the regulations then you say are really kind of they need to be readdressed to bring them more up to date with uh, modern technology and what we know now. I, I think I've had a fairly good say on it, but I would say they need to address themselves to the latest technical standards to make sure when they're specifying uh, requirements that they are addressing people with the latest technological developments and technical standards. Okay, Simon, uh, last question for you both, actually, uh, but Simon first. Um, what surprises you most about what people don't know about air quality when you're talking to them? <laughs> that, what a great question. Uh, what, what surprises me is that people uh, just think about indoor air quality as ventilation or fresh air, hmm. uh, and I think that is just so um, uh, so wrong. You know, buildings of any sort can have uh, ventilation um, um, they can have um, air conditioning or heating and air filtration, or they can have none of those or two or three of those. Uh, so it really is important that people who think about what's happening in buildings, the air in buildings, is that they think about ventilation, which can be opening windows or mechanical ventilation, air conditioning, and, of course, air filtration, 
we need to tackle all of these problems. But if we're dealing with the pollutants inside homes and, and offices and things, we do need air filtration of one sort or another. Dusty, can I just say one other thing, if I may? Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to uh, say thank you to Camphill because uh, this 2021 is the 10th year that Camphill has supported Clean Air in London's campaign to build public understanding of indoor air quality. And it really has made the, the whole world of difference to us to have that support from Camphill, but also the sort of um, advice and um, uh, you know, guidance from Peter, who, who I just see as a fantastic expert in this field. Yeah, thank you very much, Simon. I, I would just like to say that uh, I think we've barely scratched the surface today with this podcast in terms of, you know, the air, the depth of uh, um, uh, understanding and, and uh, the solutions that can be offered. Um, I think certainly we need to address, you know, air systems and uh, standalone air purification and try and... Uh, um, you know, give people more information about what they can do for themselves to, to improve their situation. OK, well, listen, gentlemen, I will leave it there for now. Peter Diamond and Simon Burkett, thank you very much. If you would like to find out more about this, uh, do follow the links in the show notes. You'll find those in the description of this podcast on your phone or whichever device you're listening to us on. Uh, they include links and contact details and anything else that you might need to get more information. Our podcast today was produced by Cam Phil, the world leader in the development and production of air filters and clean air solutions. You can find out more about them at camfill.com. Do join us next month when our podcast looks at airborne viruses and how to protect yourself from new ones that are still to come. To get that automatically, just click the subscribe button on your player right now. Until then, for myself, Dusty Rhodes, thank you so very much for listening and have a good day. Music.